was your lunch? Good? How was your morning? Better. Hey, better than the lunch. Well, that's good. You agree with this gentleman right here in the front row? And by the way, you guys aren't very enthusiastic about this. We are here to talk about the future of Thailand. Are you optimistic about the future? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no? Yes and no? Okay, let's find out. How many of you, how many of you are optimistic about the future for Thailand? That's what I thought. Yeah, that's good. We need more people to be optimistic, right? Because that's how we're going to get there. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the unexpected ways that technology, 3D printing, other technologies perhaps, are, uh, are doing that, are living up to the promise. I personally believe that technology has always helped more than it has hurt. Since we first started to chip away at rocks and wood to make tools, our first technology, uh, I think it has always helped in the long run more than it has hurt. So, We'll see if you agree after that. Um, you met me earlier this morning. My name's Jonathan Knowles, and I am joined here today on stage by three of my very good friends. We've all known each other for many years now and worked together on different projects. Uh, so I think, uh, I think we're in for a, you're in for a treat today uh, for some of the stuff that we will discuss. Um, we'll start uh, here on the left with uh, my good friend Dara Dots, folks. She is a designer. Um, and boy, how about this yellow? She did it right, didn't she? That was the color we were all trying to find. Uh, that's great. And, uh, and we'll come back and talk in a minute about the kind of stuff you do, because I use the word designer, but don't believe just that. There's much more to it than that. Uh, here to my right is my good friend Jason Dunn. Jason is a space guy. He likes things uh, to do, uh, that have to do with space. He's a, he's a guy that, uh, well, I'll talk more about how he ended up there, but he's a, he's a founder of one of the new space companies. He's someone you're going to hear from a little later, a company called Made in Space, who's doing very exciting uh, things off-world, uh, beyond uh, here on planet Earth. And down here on the far, far right, my good friend Scott Summit. Scott is an innovator. Uh, that's really the best way to describe what he does. Uh, he has applied his innovations in the world of additive manufacturing, 3D printing for many years now in very meaningful ways, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So uh, all of these people have been doing things in the 3D printing world for some time now in ways that uh, might surprise you. Uh, Dara, why don't we start here with you, and feel free, anybody who has questions here on the panel, to jump in and, and talk about this. So, yes, we say you're a designer, um, but, uh, but you're much more than that. Your particular area of focus that I know you are passionate about is helping people um, in disaster, and disaster uh, resiliency, but really disaster in the moment. How did, yes. What does that mean, and how did that get started? What was your journey and path to do this? Yeah, so um, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> Thanks for, I'm excited. Thank you for having me here. Um, I, my, the, what led me to this was actually, um, I've been a designer, and it's a, it's a funny, I was an industrial designer, and it's kind of a funny thing because I actually hated technology, so that's why it's you easy. Hated I hated technology. technology. I thought I couldn't trust it. Wait a second, you know what? I'm going to say, because I just saw a whole bunch of people in the corner of my eye go, <laughs> When she said, I hated technology, wow. Okay. I found it so frustrating, right? Like you get it to work and then it would break on you. So in college, we actually had a 3D printer, but I never even saw it. Um, when, we, when I made furniture, I would actually hand carve my own jigs and fixtures. I mean, just insane. Um, and so when I, I fast forward about, I don't know, five or six years, I, I wanted to see, I've always been in aid work and I've always wanted to figure out tangible ways of helping people. And so I wound up in Haiti, actually, wanting to learn about, um, two years after the quake, about rebuilding... After the earthquake. After the earthquake, yeah. About rebuilding the, the community and how that was going. And what I realized was the, it was as if the earthquake had just happened. And uh, the, this is two years after the quake. I thought the country would be rebuilt. Everybody would be doing great. Unfortunately, the roads were still blocked. Buildings were still collapsed. People were still devastated. And supply chains were really, really challenging. 
And uh, that's kind of what brought me down to is I realized sometimes all you needed was to fix medical equipment. So I went to clinics and hospitals, seeing what I could do to help. And so we wound up designing parts. And I was like, you know, we could actually manufacture those locally if we had a 3D printer. And that's actually what got me started on my journey, is uh, working in Haiti. And I remember those days. I yeah. remember when you came with this idea to do this. And, uh, and that was just really the beginning. Yes. Okay, so that was, and I remember the parts you were printing, the oxygen valves and so mm -hmm. much more, and you, would, you weren't just 3D printing, you were learning yes. a lot yes. about what worked and what didn't work. Yes. And I, I think you uh, applied, this morning I talked a lot about mindset and how important that was, and I believe that part of mindset that I'm talking about is the, there is no failure, only learning. Yes. And when I looked at you in those days, and when you were in Haiti after the earthquake trying to help people, I saw someone who was learning. And then... You took another big steps after that. Um, tell us a little bit about that um, and, and 3D printing. Yeah, 3D printing and big steps. Actually, um, I came back to uh, Silicon Valley and was looking for work. And someone who was here actually introduced me to this amazing man, Jason. And I actually had the privilege of working with Jason at Maiden Space back in the early days. And so I was learning about how to manufacture in extreme environments where you're completely cut off from other people. And it was just this fascinating journey. What I realized is to really have impact and scale is you got to have other people to share this with, right? And so I wound up meeting my co-founder. And that's how we started um, our nonprofit Field Ready. And we wound up going to a number of different locations around the world, asking people what they needed, and designing on-site immediately in those needs. So instead of waiting for supplies, which could sometimes take months or years, we would actually produce what they needed right there. And that was really what started our journey. Wonderful stuff. And a perfect transition here to Jason and Made in Space. Um, I said you're a space guy. Uh, I love your story, Jason. I, and I think people will enjoy hearing your story. Your story of um, growing up in Florida near Kennedy Space Center where the rockets took the astronauts to the moon uh, and you became an aerospace engineer and take the story from there, young aerospace engineer Jason just out of college. What happened? Well, you just told the whole story. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> I just got you really quickly to that um, point. So what happened? Jonathan says I'm a space guy. The, let me help m make sure you all understand what that means. Um, a lot of people, when they understand I work in the space industry, say, oh, what's your favorite planet? Thinking, I must have a favorite planet. Maybe it's Jupiter or Saturn. Um, it's Earth. This is my favorite planet. I, I, um, I think it's an amazing planet. There's, there's nothing like it that we know of. Um, How many people would agree with Jason that this is Earth their favorite is the right planet? <laughs> Good. Okay. It's okay if you don't. Um, I grew up, as Jonathan, Jonathan mentioned, um, on the Gulf Coast of Florida, which is in a spot that's directly across the state of Florida from the Kennedy Space Center, which is where NASA has launched everything they launch into space, and including the astronauts who went to the moon. And, um, but I grew up kind of appreciating nature. I grew up on the, on the water, on my boat, and, and going out to islands, and um, really appreciating this planet. And, but um, as a young child, when there was a space shuttle launch, I could go out in my driveway and see it at nighttime going up into the sky like a, a little star moving up into the sky. And I remember thinking about those, um, those astronauts were a little bit like how I would take my boat to the island offshore. Here's these people leaving the planet, um, going into space. And I had this uh, kind of profound um, recognition that all of us on Earth are on this, the shore of space. We're all equally close to space. And, um, and that's what really got me hooked on this idea of, of space exploration. Um, and then it was later on, um, you know, through college and the work I started doing that I realized, and I'll talk a little bit about this later today, how um, space really holds for us an opportunity to allow humanity to expand in a way that actually helps planet Earth. So when we think about uh, humanity's biggest challenges, the things that Singularity University addresses, whether it's energy, food, hunger, poverty, um, having you know, recycling and things like that, these are, these are challenges that we have to solve when we go to space. There's no if, and, or but about it. We, when we go to space, we have to 
uh, develop technology to collect all of our, the energy we need from the sun and to store it in efficient ways and to grow the food we need and to recycle our waste. So as we develop these necessities for space travel, we inherently will solve humanity's biggest challenges here. And I think the, the goal for us is not to have no problems, but it's to have better problems than we currently have. And I think that's where we're headed. I love it. And I love that that's been your uh, sort of approach and outlook on everything you've done since I've known you for all these years now and what you've done at Made in Space. So you're, you're really going to enjoy his session later today, by the way. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. And, and Scott, um, boy, Scott, uh, talk about innovation. Scott, you, uh, you done work at Apple. You've done lots of different interesting things. Uh, you first came on uh, the horizon to me with your work in prosthetics. And I remember sitting down and talking with you and learning from you um, about how at, by being a designer, by really paying attention to design the verb versus just design the noun, that, uh, that you could make such a meaningful impact in people's lives. Um, tell us how you ended up doing that and what got you there to... Yeah, well, well that was always the goal. Um, I started, my, my love was always in machine shops. So I'm happiest if I'm drilling holes in metal, you know, or cutting metal or machining it or things like that, using milling machines and lathes and things. But there's only so much you can do with that as an industrial designer. I worked at Apple and Nike and things like that. The problem I always found unsatisfying about that is that you're making millions of identical parts. And that's the goal with Apple, is that every part is extremely identical. They go to great lengths to make parts exactly clones of each other. And I always found that disconnected from the real world where we're not clones of each other. Everybody is so different. And that's what makes the world interesting, is that everybody is so different. But injection molding and large-scale manufacture doesn't speak to that. And I wanted to get involved with products that were very profoundly meaningful to people, uh, prosthetic limbs and medical products, medical devices, that could really change people's lives in ways that a mass-produced part never will. So I founded a company called Bespoke 10 years ago, looking at 3D printing prosthetic legs. And when I went around to doctors and hospitals and, and uh, even amputees asking if that was possible, they all essentially laughed at me. And that's when I knew, okay, I'm onto something here. You know, this is going to be good if I'm getting laughed at a lot. And so the more they laughed, that, that was a source of energy. And that company uh, took off, and we went from prosthetic legs to scoliosis to spinal muscle atrophy to uh, different body parts that we could fix um, using 3D printing, and we came up with processes and algorithms where you could scan the human body and then print something for the body, and that would be unique to that person because the first ingredient in that part is that person. And that's profound and meaningful because you can't do that in any other technology, at least not in any cost-effective way. And so we were excited by that, and we pushed it far, I was then, the company was acquired by 3D Systems, which was the Microsoft of 3D printing and the inventor of 3D printing. And they asked me to be essentially the um, director of a Skunk Works, the design director of the company, but also to run a Skunk Works, which is a term that we use a lot because I think it's a very relevant term. It's a group within a company that doesn't have a specific mandate. You're not focused on quarterly profits. You're kind of insulated from the rest of the company and the marketing. But your job is to take technology, take it out on the open road, and see how far you can push it. Nobody else in the company ever has that goal. And so that was exciting. So we started printing everywhere from the sound a dolphin makes for dolphin research. That was a weird one. Then we were asked, could we 3D print an acoustic guitar, the entire guitar? So we did the first one of those. Uh, we were then 3D printing food, algorithmically designed food. So we did that. So uh, ceramics everything, um, clothing. So that was an exciting role, to see how far you could take this new technology in ways that nobody had ever gone before. And we did that. That was a rush. And my, my passion still is finding ways of connecting technology to human need in ways that nobody's ever expected. And especially in those ways that people tend to laugh at. 
that's, that's when you know you're on target. You know, that's uh, something I think that you might notice a pattern here. Uh, you said laugh at, and I'll, I'll say uh, you were dismissed. And um, I know that you were dismissed. Oh, I remember yeah. <laughs> people dismissing you. A lot, when You were yeah. starting this. And I remember when you and the guys were starting your project, there were other groups, teams that were looking at you going, whatever, those guys. Uh, and yet, by the way, out of that particular, because this was an SU company that mm -hmm. it came out of, out of that particular group, I think you're the only ones that sort of went off and became so, anyway. There's uh, others. But you were dismissed a bit, and, uh, and I think that's important when we think about that mindset piece of stuff. We'll talk about the technology here in a second. Is, right. And I hope you're seeing that, that um, the pattern is uh, one of uh, an open mindset, a growth mindset, uh, being willing to just open doors and look inside, maybe go inside. We say an innovation mindset. It's, it's an exploration mindset. It's a mindset of what if. Mm -hmm. um, it's that mindset of there is only learning, not failure. Right. I don't want to give away your talk, but you started out pretty simple with what you guys were doing. Are you going to talk about that in your talk? The, yeah, of course. The, okay, we can great. talk about it now, too. So you started off pretty simple. It was... You know, I mean, today you're doing some pretty amazing stuff. I showed a little video clip of it, but what was it? You just came to the conclusion, hey, we just need to... I don't know where you're going with this, uh, but we, the way the company Made in Space started was we, um, we've always, we have this big vision, we still do, that, uh, that the future in space will involve manufacturing almost anything you need there. There's... Um, there's really not much of a reason to make things on Earth and send them on rockets. Um, we had to find a way to get started, and um, our, one of our good friends and advisor happened to be a space shuttle astronaut, Dan Barry, and he said, I've been to the space station, and they could use a 3D printer. And at the time, the, um, the 3D printer was the wooden maker bot. This was like when, when MakerBot was selling a, printer. A, a printer made out of wood. <laughs> and, um, and he pointed to it on the table, and he said, guys, this, this piece of wood would be useful on the space station. And the reason is today, when, or back then, when something would break on the space station, they would either wait for a rocket to bring them the next part, and that could be months or a year, or they would fix it with whatever they had. And what they have is duct tape, basically. So... Um, so three guys in their 20s just started with a, hey, let's, let's put, put one of those up there. Let's put one of those up there. People completely dismissed it, and you saw the <clears throat> animation in my talk earlier, and he's going to talk about more what they're doing now. How many years later? Um, nine. Nine years nine. later. It's a great example of the exponential. Yeah. Uh, I think, and for you, the same kind of thing. You were dismissed as yeah. people, and how, you know, how'd you handle that? And, yeah, I think I kind of think that's part of innovation. Um, I think that when people laugh at you, it's a sign that you're on the right path. I, I love that you said that. Um, so I um, like to say that I'm kind of stubborn, maybe a little decidedly determined. Um, so uh, I, I knew when I went down there that I was onto something. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I actually, I think, came to you and Scott for help on stuff because I knew that you guys knew about manufacturing and I knew nothing about it because, as I said before, I didn't trust technology. I didn't like it. Um, and especially, um, most of this technology is made for, made for the lab itself, not made for outside or the real world. And I find that frustrating. Mm. And so people would look at me like I was crazy, taking these wooden machines down to Haiti mm. um, and teaching people how to manufacture on them. And what was really interesting about that, um, I think I got a little lost here, but um, was actually the part where you get to customize things mm -hmm. and people get to feel empowered about what they're creating for themselves and mm -hmm. solving problems and learning a lot about um, the environments and, and how you can innovate with in different ways. And uh, it really led us to do a number of things, actually, with manufacturing, even beyond uh, 3D printing. Mm -hmm. And I think the real advantage was the ability to create and innovate in these environments. And then because of the internet and because of files, we could actually share these products around the world like that mm -hmm. um, really quickly. And similar to with Jason, um, you can almost email a solution to space. Mm -hmm. And with us, you can actually almost email a solution to a crisis zone. And I think it's just been a really amazing mm -hmm. So another pattern that is showing up here is um, a 
uh, let's do some good. So it's, it's all, there's the profit piece of it, and Bodana mentioned that this morning, our uh, managing director for our uh, summits. Um, but there's also this, and we can help. And we can help. Yeah. Like, we can make Earth better. And we can help. We can make people's lives better. Um, and it's like one particular technology that we're here today on this panel talking about, 3D printing, that we're all talking about has done that. Uh, let's talk for just a minute about where some of this is going and how it might help people because uh, it seems to have been doing pretty good so far. You know, one of our projects, and I think somebody's going to talk about the generative design uh, uh, NASA project in one of their talks here that we kicked off years ago. This stuff's ramping up quickly, but where, where could it go? And as you're, as you're answering that, if we could think about and how do uh, economies, countries like Thailand participate in this and benefit from some of this stuff? Who wants to just jump in with some ideas of, uh, around some of this stuff? What are you excited about most around? Remember earlier today I talked about we look this way? But our technology is doing this. When you three lift your gaze up here, what are you excited about? I think there's been a shift recently that's, that's especially exciting that none of us can really get our heads around, which is when 3D printing started 35 years ago, um, I had the second machine ever made. Its serial number was 000002. And that's what we started playing around on. It could make a, a product about this big. And if you exposed it to the sunshine, it would explode because of internal stresses. So it wasn't much to get excited about. The parts got bigger and bigger, and stronger and stronger. The materials got better. And then you could make a product this big. Well, that's great for a prosthetic leg. I could do an entire prosthetic leg in a printer that could print something this size. Simultaneously, printers were getting more accurate. And they were going down this direction, smaller and smaller and greater resolution parts. You still have nanotechnology and microelectronic machines, MEMS, and they were still over here, and there was a big gulf between them and the micro level. And then over here, you could only get so big before it just wasn't conceivable anymore. Well, what's happening now that's exciting is this is now a line, and the line goes from nanotechnology and MEMS consistently, there's a consistent path now that goes to the 3D printing of larger scale and larger scale to larger scale entire buildings, to things like the bridge that MX3D is going to be talking about, to what Jason's doing, which is the first time anyone's ever talked about it, but potentially infinite sized products and parts when you're printing in space. That's exciting to go from micro, nano, to infinite, large, and then in different axes, the different materials. Everywhere from on one side, pretty much all the metals, down here to biologics, things like hearts and kidneys and blood and tissue, the entire range. Well, what does that mean? We can't really get our heads around it yet. And it's going to be the next generation, the kids who are in college right now, who have known this world all throughout their adult life. They're the ones who are going to be coming up with the crazy solutions because it's too much for the rest of us to think about. This is all very new. And so that's what I'm excited to see is when somebody connects the dots and comes up with what's going to happen now that you have that capability of all this uh, range of materials and scale right at your fingertips. So that's what I'm most excited about. So materials and scale, and, and really, the, uh, it's, it's always exciting at the convergence of these things, and when you add more to these things. And so we have that, and then we add things like AI or other technologies to it, and we get even more. Uh, anything around that exciting either of you? I'm ex I was yeah. jump in. Um, I'm really excited for when, has any of you done 3D modeling? Anybody? A couple of you. So you guys know how frustrating it can be, right? <laughs> so for me, we're going in the field and trying to teach people how to use CAD that have, don't even know how to use a computer has been quite the awesome experience. <laughs> um, the, the, the payoff is great, but it takes a while and it can be frustrating and there's a lot of learning curves, right? So I am actually most thrilled about when we no longer have to use CAD, uh, when we can use goggles or glasses and look at something and just make the part and, and the machine will automatically do it so that the software is actually intuitive, that it's, it's seamless. We don't even notice we're using it. Um, I'm really excited about that kind of access so that we don't get tripped up in the design process and keep going with what we're thinking. 
Um, I'm also really excited about using the machines themselves to create their own new materials. Um, I'm excited that we can actually design new materials that we've never even dreamed of for different applications we've never even thought of, like what Scott was saying. I love it. I'll point out uh, something that excites me, and it's also something that I think for an audience um, like yours maybe even is concerning and something to maybe you're thinking a lot about uh, today and tomorrow is that with uh, digital manufacturing and 3D printing, we no longer are constrained to a certain location for where we make things. And the, uh, for a country like Thailand that relies so much on its exports, I think this is a big area that you should be thinking about, is that um, what happens when, when uh, cities and villages and places that depend on imports all of a sudden start doing the manufacturing locally. And I think this is a huge thing that, that 3D printing enables, and we're already seeing it begin. Um, and, and the implications, I don't think we've, we've fully wrapped our heads around yet. But it does change probably what is being produced by export countries. You know, maybe it's building the machines that do the manufacturing and exporting those into, you know, the countries that want to manufacture it locally. So that, I think just the idea of changing you know, what is being shipped around the world is really interesting, and hopefully even getting to the point where maybe we can be a little bit easier on this planet in terms of the shipping that we're doing because we, we can uh, manufacture locally. Mm -hmm. And by the way, 90% of all trade between nations happens on, on ships, ships on the ocean. Scott, did you want to? Well, just to build on that, what's interesting about 3D printing is also it's um, flattening the earth, as Tom Friedman would put it in the sense that uh, an example that we lived in when we are in 3D systems, our engineers were all in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and the designers were all in California. Now, if you know anything about the United States, you know that no Californian ever wants to go to Rock Hill, South Carolina. <laughs> You'll go to very great lengths not to ever go there. And so we did. And one of the ways we found to, to not have to go to Rock Hill, South Carolina, was that we would design a part and would print it, and then we would turn on their machine at night, send them the part, and get it printing. So by the time they came in in the morning, it was right there on the print bed. And we just did that as a way to not have to travel. But we didn't think about it. We were faxing three-dimensional stuff. It was essentially just like using a fax machine, but with physical parts, because we were all within a few hours holding the same part in our hand and talking about it on the phone. Well, that's a weird concept. That's right out of Star Trek. But what it means is, for one thing, less travel, so that's less carbon footprint on the world, but also it means that as a collaborative tool, it's a pretty spectacular way to get people from all over the world to work on the same project when it's a complex three-dimensional shape, that everybody can actually just fax their parts to each other. That was never possible before. I think that's, by the way, uh, one of the uh, most significant Convergence Technologies is the internet with these things because it is enabling uh, everyone to have access to this stuff and participate. And, and we're learning uh, that there are designers coming from all over the world who we didn't know they were even out there who have access to tools now and participating. And, you know, when we, again, when we talk about mindset, community is an important part of it. Uh, I think it's important for everybody here to know that that's really hopefully what you're doing here for the next two days is you're not going to a conference, is you're joining a community of like-minded people who really do think this way and want to do things and have connections to other people who are thinking about these things and working on these projects. What, um, what do you guys think is in the next... Uh, well, let me, let me put it out there. Is there, first of all, anything else anybody wants to say about something that's exciting them? That they just, I don't want to have you give away anything from your talks. Um, Institute materials, I think. Uh, materials. materials. Yeah. I, mean, I was talking about designing materials, but um, a lot of manufacturing, not only do we have to ship the finalized product around the world, but we also have to get the bulk materials that we're using to make the products, so, so the waste. And I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, we have a lot, unfortunately, we have a lot of waste in this planet, and a lot of it comes from manufacturing. And so I think it's, it's going to be interesting as we design our new products, also thinking what materials we can use to create those products with. Um, I'm particularly very excited about the potential of using a lot more recycled plastic um, and different types of plastic. 
uh, potentially in the future to create new homes instead of you know different methodologies like that so that we're no longer wasting and having to burn garbage or ship mm -hmm. it to space as some people want to do and I think I think that's really important to think about. Now Scott you mentioned Star Trek. Uh, how many of you watch Star Trek? And how many watch Star Wars? Please leave now. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, Star Wars is okay, I guess. It's, uh, um, but uh, I say that both of them are great, by the way. I'm kidding. Uh, uh, I say that because um, uh, some of you know him too. Gene uh, Roddenberry's son, the creator of Star Trek. Right. Rod Roddenberry's a good friend of ours. Mm -hmm. And we think about science fiction, and we think about how science fiction informs um, the future and how we think about things, and I know you guys do. There's the obvious example of 3D printing, sort of like the transporter. I know you're gonna talk a little bit about that in your talk, but from a, I think this is a very valuable exercise and I wanna do this now so that you can all do this beyond this room here today, and that's a little bit of what we call science fiction prototyping. It's one of those great little tools that helps you to have that gaze to look up here. So let's ask each of you, when you think about the future in a really science fiction kind of way, so no constraints whatsoever, and 3D printing, what can you imagine? What's your secret 3D printing science fiction fantasy? So there, there are two, not necessarily good fantasies both, but there are two books that really inspired me. Um, if anybody is interested in some science fiction that is very touched down to earth in its own way. One is an author named Neil Stevenson, and he wrote a book called The Diamond Age. And he predicted in the 90s what, what is still taking shape now in 3D printing today. And it was, he was using molecular assemblers, which was this idea that instead of using lasers, which we use now mostly, and, and uh, nozzles and things, that the parts would assemble themselves molecule by molecule. But the parts would be ready on demand and complex parts. And we are now making increasingly complex parts. And that's what's kind of exciting. So I still reread that book every year or two because it still comes up with new ideas. And I borrowed the name of my first company, Bespoke, off of one of the characters in his book, just to pay homage to him. The other book actually comes from you, Jonathan. <laughs> that uh, We were at a conference in 3D printing, and John was hosting it at Autodesk. And he threw in a book called Player Piano by Kurt Vonnegut, written in the 50s. Yeah. And it was, I was thinking, why in this, the most high technology company, Autodesk, would they give us this 1950s book by Kurt Vonnegut? And it, it's about what happens, the dark side of automation, when you have a real bifurcation, a real split in the class of humanity into those who are enabled and those who are obsoleted. And the ideas that he presented and projected in the 50s are still very relevant and very much worth paying attention to because it does bring that humanity side of the, all this technology that we get very excited about. It reminds us that we have to pay attention to who it is displacing and who it is obsoleting as we go and what to do about their plight as well. So I recommend those two books, Play Our Piano and The Diamond Age. Fabulous. I have to say, tell, ask me later, I've gotten to know Neil a little bit over the last few years. And I'll, yeah, he's quite a guy. Read The Diamond Age. It, yeah, I can tell you, it used to be required reading in Silicon Valley. Yeah. In the early 90s, if you weren't reading The Diamond Age. And Snow Crash. And, and Snow Crash. Comicon, yeah, all his Holy trilogy. Books, uh, so they're, and uh, Player Piano as well. Okay, either of you guys have a science fiction moment? About, Jason? I don't know if it, this, I, this isn't exactly science okay. fiction, but it, it sure will sound like it. Um, so I'm fascinated by what's happening in digital biology. It's something Jonathan mentioned in his, in his talk earlier today. Um, I think that where we head in terms of digital manufacturing is we start to go closer and closer and eventually all the way to nature and how nature works. And rather than building machines that build things, I think we're going to start to learn how to manipulate nature to build things for us. And um, we'll, I, don't ask me when this happens, but I definitely think everybody should be thinking about it. Um, I, I think one day it won't be about how do you 3D print a coffee table, it's how do you design a seed that you plant in the ground and grow a coffee table. So does that sound like science fiction to you? 
Because I is. know I people works. who are working on exactly that thing yeah. that he talked about, right? This is, people are thinking this way right yeah. now. You should be yeah, thinking should this be. way right now. Whatever business that you're in, you should be thinking this way right now. Anything come into mind here? Yeah, I guess I'm um, kind of build off what uh, Jason shared. Is I have this fantasy, so I always have a go bag when I go into a crisis zone of various tools, because you never know what you're going to need to create. Um, and my go bag of the future, in, in my mind, is now that with... The go bag, by the way, let's tell people what that is. Oh, a go so. bag is when there's an emergency and you get a phone call that there's an earthquake, you grab this bag and what are the basics that you need? Um, medical devices. Emergency kit. Emergency kit. Of course, two or three 3D printers, because usually only one works when you get there. Um, <laughs> lots of tools. Um, and so my, go, my emergency kit of the future um, I, it's going to be um, in my pocket, a little, a little container with um, various forms of bacteria that have been designed so that when I get to that environment, wherever there's a crisis, I can, I can then feed the bacteria and so I can start to produce materials that I want right then and there so I don't have to carry everything with me. Wonderful. Does that sound like science fiction to you? <laughs> there are people working on these things. You, you should be thinking about all these things. Uh. In fact, and I, think, I think NASA's working on it right now, or they have bacteria that they're trying to get it to uh, use its catalyst or main form of nutrients is from carbon dioxide mm. um, to then start pr producing proteins. So it's happening right now in amazing ways. And some of them are producing spider silk, right? Um, yes. And it's pretty, pretty phenomenal. So it's not that far off, actually. It's kind of crazy. Uh, it, it, so the reason I brought the science fiction thing up is to encourage you to think that way as well. Um, uh, enjoy reading some science fiction. Um, I'm going to throw in just for the sake of a book, because we did mention player piano up here. I think I have to balance a little with um, a book recommendation uh, called a book called Factfulness by Hans Rosling. Um, Bill Gates last year when the book came out said that it was one of the most important books he's ever read, and he bought a copy for every college graduate in America. That should tell you it's worth looking at the book, <laughs> and turning it over, reading the back of the book. Um, read Factfulness by Hans Rosling. Look at his TED Talks. He's mm -hmm. done several. He's, one, he's been my favorite TED speaker for many years. Uh, he just passed away a year ago, but uh, Distinguished Life, read his book. Uh, as well of the, as those. I think in the last few minutes, by the way, I'm going to give you two a chance to think about it for a second since we were sort of doing a book thing here. Uh, think about any that you'd throw in there, book titles. Scott, any want to add to that while you're thinking? There's one called Makers by Cory Doctorow. Makers by Cory Doctorow. And then yes. Makers by uh, the co-founder of Wired. Uh, Chris, same, Anderson. Chris Anderson. Chris Anderson, yes. Both of those books read back to back I think are very relevant for the startup culture and the uh, maker community and innovation in general. Yep, and, and, and a good view into 3D printing, uh, yes. how Learned we got office. here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I go super basic? Yeah. And not so deep. Um, there's a magazine called Make Magazine. Um, it's super simple and they have all these kind of DIY projects so you can make your own things. And what I loved about the magazine is it's a visual way to look at different ways of creating and methodologies in a really simple way, but it kind of inspires me to look at different ways of, of fabricating things in the field. And, and, and every day, it's like every time you get a magazine, it's a new project, and so you're also yourself growing and, and conceiving of new ideas and innovating. And One of the things we did at Autodesk, as you all know, was we built a facility for employees that had a complete yes. shop, wood shop, metal shop, welding shop, 3D printing shop. Prototyping is so critical to innovate. CNC's, yeah. all of this, um, to get them in the mindset of making. So I really appreciate that, no matter what their job is. You might yeah. be a lawyer, you might be in finance, but just to get in that mindset of, hey, this is a thing and mm -hmm. people can do it to enhance creativity. Exactly. So I, I think that's a great recommendation. Anything that... Um, I'll give you a book that's not science fiction, but it's one that inspired me a lot. It's uh, by uh, it's a book called 2081, the number 2081. It's written by uh, Gerard O'Neill, and I'll speak about him in the beginning of my talk in just a little bit, um, some of his ideas for building space colonies. But the book 2081 is, uh, he wrote in 1981, it was his prophecy for 100 years from the time he wrote it, and 
when you read the book, it's incredibly accurate. There's things that are happening today that he was describing. He was describing the internet. He was describing um, electric vehicles. He even describes the Hyperloop mm. in this book. So, nice. um, but he goes further than, you know, there's what's happening today is accurate, but then he keeps going. So, I would encourage you to read that book because it, he paints a beautiful picture for the future. I think one thing Jeff Rogers opened today with was how what we're doing here is uh, designing our preferred future. Yes. And I think this, this is one example of a book that, I, for me, paints a very preferred future that we could have. Well, you know, we've all been asked for many years, how do we create another Silicon Valley in Bangkok. Denmark? Thailand, Argentina, Brazil, yeah. name your India, wherever. I, by the way, always answer, you can't and you don't want to, but you should get an idea about how some of the people there think and what they do, and, and, and we should become friends and part of a community so we can get a little bit of what we do going to Thailand and a lot of what Thailand does back to us because that's how innovation always works. I hope this is not inappropriate. I'm going to say it because it's in a book, um, How Innovation Works by Stephen Johnson, another great book to read. He said, innovation is ideas having sex. <laughs> that's what he said. And sort of, that's, you know what I mean by that, right? I don't have to go into any detail, but yeah, let's all get together. Let's good. have more ideas. And, and so now you know a little bit of what we're like. I hope you have a chance to spend more time with us. Listen to their talks today. I hope this was interesting and useful for you. Uh, before we go into the next session, thank you for your time, and we'll see you all a little later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.